Hi there! My name is Day Music, and I just released my song Oh Pause onto my channel. A bit of a passion project for sure. While the song itself isn't that groundbreaking, I actually wanted to talk about the video aspect of that song, or rather the audio visualizer. By now, I've been using FL Studio's Z Game Editor Visualizer for a few years now. It's a super useful resource to have within FL Studio because it, it allows you to synchronize certain parts of the video to specific parts of your song using the, the mixer. So if we switch over here, uh, you can see this audio shake is specifically to the kick and then you got the parameter shake to the vocals over here. If you aren't aware, using Z Game Editor Visualizer within FL Studio is a great way to synchronize specific parts of your video to specific parts of your song. But what I wanted to talk about actually is the more, I guess, intricate details uh, of that video. So if you see here, there's actually a lot going on over here. I'm pretty sure this is so far my biggest video project I've made in FL Studio. And I kind of wanted to break down what makes it so big and what makes it so like intricate, I guess. Because um, if you don't know what's going on over here, these are all buffer layers. Buffer layers are, when I first uh, saw them, a bit of a complex topic to talk about. Because the layer, these layers itself aren't the buffer layers. It's the output layer that is technically the buffer layer. That's why you see this button over here says to buffer. When you click on that, it creates one of these colored layers and then sends that to an output layer that is used as a buffer. But what is a buffer? Uh, that's a good question. Hang on, let me get my... Oh god, I hit everything. Alright, well what is a buffer? Well, if you look at the definition for... Well, if you look at one of the many definitions for buffer, uh, the one that I think is uh, more applicable to the situation is the one for computing, a temporary memory area in which data is stored while it is being processed or transferred, especially one used while streaming video or downloading audio. So when you send one of these effects to a buffer, you're storing the output of that, which you can see down here, you're storing the output of um, th those groups of layers uh, into another layer that is being used as an image layer. If you hover over to, to buffer, you see in the um, upper left of F FL Studio, it says redirect this layer to a buffer that can be used as image source and other layers. So essentially that's what it is. A, a buffer is the image layer that is used to store the output from whatever other layers you're using in that buffer. So why do I have so many of them? Well, there's a few reasons why uh, you would use buffers, why you should use even in your projects. So for one, flexibility. That's one of the, the, the bigger factors. Um, there, there are some uh, effects within FL Studio that I'm not too much of a fan of. However, I used to use them a lot more back in the day. So for example, I don't actually have one in this project. So uh, let me pull up and let me pull up a new project here. All right, so here we have a blank ZG Eviz uh, project or um, I guess effect. I don't know what you would call this. One good use I've seen of using buffer layers is for the vignette effect. So if you know, if you go to post process down here, there's the vignette effect, uh, and let's see if I can let's see if I can pull up uh, just a little temporary picture here. Just one of the ones that FL Studio has. Let's use this one, sure. And then I actually prefer to use uh, HUD image for my image layers. Just if you use HUD image, make sure to uh, set the in source from post effect to image source so that you can actually use it as the image and let's just set that to the image and then there we go all right so we have our image and then we have our vignette if i move the vignette in front of the image uh like that then you'll see that we now have the vignette i can switch the oh, okay well it's not going to be able to stay on there i'm going to switch this back to here for now that way we can see it all at once um so you see if i change the alpha nothing happens and this was one of those things that always bothered me about the vignette effect is one of the easiest things that I figured would be the parameter to change, to change the amount of the effect, doesn't do anything. So you see I'm moving the alpha back and forth, nothing's changing. However, if you change the inner radius, then you can get that to change. If you change the outer radius, you can get that to change. Uh, the lightness doesn't do anything, saturation, hue, like for some reason, I don't know if they just don't know that this effect doesn't work properly or not. 
but none of this is doing anything. So how do you get the vignette to actually have any of these um, changes uh, to it? Also, what I just did was I pressed Alt, or I held Alt and clicked. If you don't know, holding Alt and clicking on a parameter sets it back to its default state. So what do you do about this? Well, let me just rename some of these so that it can be easier to track. So we're gonna have our uh, vignette layer right here. We're gonna move this to the left because we want that to be first. Because what we're gonna do is we're actually going to have another layer right here. This is gonna be our background. Let's just name that background. That's not how you spell that. Just name that background. Now, what about this layer? Of the two options for post-processing, I guess color grading and color correction, there's Yulian color correction that I use uh, often and Dub Switcher Color Shaper. This one's a bit more, I guess, uh, in depth. So if you don't know really what to do with all of these, all of these parameters, then I, I recommend uh, using uh, Yulian Color Corrections. A bit simpler. So what does uh, what does that do, and how is that going to affect the vignette? Well, so what we get, what we're going to do after I rename this layer, color correction, we're going to send this one. Uh, to a buffer and you see that what it does is it grabs both of these layers uh, So this one and the one to the left. That's why we moved it to the left Otherwise if we had this one there, it would also grab that one and just make the image disappear. So we want that to be uh, The vignette first then the color correction which is going to be sent to a buffer which we haven't gotten yet So what we're gonna do is we're gonna get another image layer make sure to turn off po uh, post effect and then you see right here, now that we have this one as a buffer, we have the output from layer color correction, which is what we named uh, this layer. So if we set that, well, there you go. Look, we have your, we have our vignette now over our image. Uh, but for some reason, it's inverted. I don't actually know why. I actually don't know why that did that. So that's interesting. But now that we have our vignette uh, and our color correction over the image, uh, the background layer, what, what we can do now is you see we can uh, we can change the various parameters of the color correction. We can even get, uh, whoops. We can even get, uh, maybe not, here, let me switch back to the other one. I'm trying to see if I can get color out of it. Oh, well, there we go. So we got some red here. So you can get some red, you can get some uh, green, which makes it yellow. And then you can get some blue. So yeah, so if you use the dub switcher color shaper, unsurprisingly, you can, shape more of the color from the vignette and then what you would do uh, to invert this is you would essentially just change the way this this thing works here oh i'm changing the wrong one there you go so you got your inner radius your outer radius so you see having this this buffer layer where the vignette and then the color shaper uh are together you can actually get more out of your uh out of your vignette and then so now you might be thinking, well, that vignette is is like too intense. Like, how do I draw it back? Well, since both of these effects are going into the image layer, the image layer has its own alpha slider that you can, you know, draw it back and, and pull it back up and all that. So if, you, if we just reset this, I don't even know which ones I just touched anymore. Uh, if we just reset this. Oh, that's interesting. I actually like that. All right, if we just switch this back to the regular black one, there we go. I believe that's correct. Uh, if we switch that back to the regular black one, you see if I have that all the way up, then that's, I think, even more intense than what it was the, what the vignette effect was by itself. But you see, I can bring it back. I can make it looser. I can make make I can make it lighter. So yeah, that's one of the reasons why you would want to use a a buffer layer is to get more flexibility out of effects that I feel like are lacking functionality, honestly. Like, why why don't these do anything? That's been a problem for a while and they've never seemed to fix that. All right, so if we get rid of this, this was just a temporary one. This is still the same uh, project. So if we go back to this one, another thing that I like using buffer layers for are for shadows. Uh, so as you might know, uh, there is a uh, drop shadow effect. Uh, I or a couple of them actually. I use I use dub switcher drops shadow because it actually allows for, again, more customization. You see that there's all of these things here that that change uh, quite a bit of things. And not only do I use it here. Actually, what is this? This is for the lyrics. If I pull up the song, 
over here. If we switch to somewhere in the song where there's lyrics. So you see the lyrics ha uh, not only have a shadow and you can see the shadow and if I bring it down, you see it goes away. Um, but if I bring down the shadow, you can see that I also have an outline around the text. I've, I've learned that you can actually use the dub switcher drop shadow effect to create uh, an outline around you know certain things. For me, I like having an outline and a drop shadow around my text so I can you know make it pop more, bring more attention to it. So uh, if you just mess around with these settings, I have the, the hardness all the way up. So if I bring this back up, mess around with the hardness, you see that you know it's changing the well I guess the hardness of the um, of the shadow, change the curve. The hardness and the curve are the, are the things that essentially make the shadow more of a shadow. So if I bring this shadow back, you can see that if I change the curve, it makes it like thicker or it makes it softer. And then if I bring that up and then bring, change the hardness, you see it, it also makes it darker or makes it softer. So if you want to mess around with shadows or uh, outlines for specific elements of your video, I recommend using Dub Switcher Drop Shadow, but then there's also um, uh, Yulian Drop Shadow. Uh, that I'll sometimes use. I think that one has the ability to, uh, if you want for some reason more intense shadows, you can use Yulian Drop Shadow and it will have uh, the option to create a, a times 10 intensity shadow, uh, which I, I've, I've used sometimes. Again, I like to use shadows and um, outlines to make certain elements pop. So if I have, um, if I have times 10 shadow, then it, it brings it out even more. Uh, let's see. So what else do I use the buffers for? Like what else is going on over here? One other thing that I use the, the, buff the buffers for is actually one of the more complicated things that I've managed to, I don't know if I can say figure out because sometimes I'll just mess around with it until I get it working. But uh, if you know about masking uh, in like general art programs like Photoshop or um, Adobe Premiere, uh, anything there's there's masking in like a lot of programs uh, and th that's here too but I feel like the masking in here is a bit confusing that I've only relatively been able to understand so what is masking well masking that's a good question actually so what is masking well essentially masking is for example in art taking an area uh, and using that as a mask so whenever you draw something on that mask uh, only that area will be affected by what you draw uh, and then inversely anything outside of the mask will not be affected by whatever you're, you're drawing so if you say draw a shape uh let me see if i can pull it up here it works so if you say draw a shape and uh if you see right here this is what the mask actually looks like the white part is where things will be the black part is where, where things won't be uh and you see i actually use the mask here this one is for the audio spectrum so if you look uh here in the project as um as the mask fades in and slides uh, from left to right. So if I turn off the mask preview here, uh, if we see what that was, that was actually this audio spectrum right here. The audio spectrum and this little effect here, that's the uh, one of the prefab lines that FL Studio just has. The, the, HUD, the HUD prefab, I just decided to change my my layout a little bit so I have the prefab right there and then I have the audio spectrum as you'll see just also up here and again that was done by the mask right here so see that's one of the things that you would use uh, a mask for is just to make things like appear uh, more m more interestingly uh, additionally this text that's going on right here I don't know if, I, if I'll be able to pull up the um okay this texture right here uh this one here there we go so you see f for this mask right here all of this is uh black right here and all of this is white and what's actually happening here is i'm actually automating the position of the text here so whenever it uh whenever whenever the text drops down into the mask here, you can see it right here So what's going on there is the text is dropping down into the mask and then being revealed. And that's how that effect is doing. So that's 
that's a few a few reasons why you'd want to use a mask is to make like interesting reveals or or disappearances too because you see at, at the end of that uh let's see you'll see at at the end of that um that that section because i didn't want the title of the song to be there the entire time i just kind of wanted it to appear and then disappear so you see it disappears and the way that that works is if we pull up the the mask again it's essentially just uh, it's essentially just the, the same thing whenever um, whenever I wanted it to disappear I'll just take the mask and then just move it to the side and you see just that little bit of movement brings the text from inside the mask to outside the mask and then it makes it disappear now how does masking work uh, in FL Studio well it's honestly kind of complicated so I'll try my best to explain it, even though, like I said, I'm still kind of confused how it works. Uh, Cause you see, so this is what I did was I have an image layer here. This image layer is just this white box right here. Cause I can make it, if you press this button here for the image layer uh, or the image effect, uh, it makes a solid color. So instead of using, you see we're down here, instead of using uh, an image source or using the basic image source, I can press solid color and it creates a solid color. Uh, I don't think I can change. Oh no, there you go. Yeah, you see saturation. So if you wanted to use the image layer for uh, just a, a basic color, you can um, uh, turn up the saturation, uh, change the hue and all that stuff. But for me, like I said, for masks, the only colors you need are white and black. So the the basic color of just as soon as you press solid color, it's white. I think at least. Yeah, as soon as you press solid color, it's white. Uh, that's all I needed. So I, t I took that, I positioned it where I needed it to be because of course it'll be um, like that. It's the entire screen, uh, as you can see right there. It, it takes up the entire, because if I press mask preview and then if I bring this back over here so that you can see it, you see that it takes up the entire, uh, the entire screen, more or less. Again, the reason why this is uh, up here is because uh, I have it going out into uh, a buffer layer, and the buffer layer is changing the positioning again. But if I get rid of this so that we can see what's going on some more, uh, let me reset. Okay, so uh, you see this layer is called text mask, and then I have in the text masked layer, that is where um, this, this mask layer is being sent to. Uh, and then from there, you see that this is on the right. So what it's doing is it's it's gonna uh, this mask. If I press mask preview, you see down here, it's gonna appear uh, over. Let me bring the this thing back. Uh, it's gonna appear over all of the text because of course I want the text uh, to be uh, revealed from the mask. If I put it over the mask, then it's just gonna be over the mask. It's not gonna be masked. So you want the mask to be over the items that you want to be masked. I have the two text layers. One for if you go over here to uh, add content text, you see I just have the author and title, I guess macros. And then I have, uh, of course, in FL Studio, you go over here to um, options, project info, and you see the title and the um, author. That's what these use. Those, that's, that's the information that those macros use. So you can just I don't know. It, also, you can just type the words in there. I don't know. It's just easier, I guess. But if, if we go back over here, so you see the the text one, text two. Uh, in order to, to get the text to appear in the in the mask, I just uh, automate the Y positions. Uh, I have the drop shadow next to them, so that, like I said, both of them, both of the texts have like I don't even know if you can see it. It's like a very subtle drop shadow that should be around. Yeah, like right there. A very uh, subtle drop shadow uh, and then I have text translate that doesn't mean like translate like a translation it's the mathematic term uh, translate so what this pretty much uh, is is uh, if I wanted to uh, you see this is on this this time it's the the HUD image effect is set to post effect so uh, what what that would do is if I wanted to take all of this that I've oops, if I wanted to take all of these effects that I've just created, the, the text effects and also the text shadow effect, 
uh, and I wanted to move them, I can simply uh, change this and you see that it moves the entire effect or the entire, I guess, stack of effects as I think what FO Studio calls them. It moves the entire uh, stack of effects. And then all of that is being masked over here. And then you see this one's going to a buffer because this buffer uh, or this, these, this stack is being output to this one text out. So you see this one is coming from uh, text masked, which is this one. And let me tell you, trying to figure out how masks work, that actually takes longer than, probably longer than I just explained. And I don't even know if I explained it correctly. This is my first time trying to make a video like this. So please uh, bear with me if I'm not making a lot of sense. If you have any questions, I think now is probably a good time to say, uh, I'm, I, I'm, I do much better when I'm not trying to vocally s explain things. Uh, if you have any questions, leave them in the comments. I will gladly help you the best I can. Uh, because like I said, I've been using uh, Z Game Editor Visualizer for a few years now, and I've noticed that the like the the support for this effect isn't uh, the greatest. Like I, I've been to the the Discord uh, for the Z Game Editor Visualizer specifically, uh, and I've asked them for help, and I've either gotten no response or just. Uh, very generic responses like, oh, well, don't use that, use this instead. Or why would you want to use that? And it's like, that's not helpful. I, I'm trying to figure something out. I would very much like help figuring that out, whether it can or can't be done. And that's why I'm recording this video is there's a lot going on here that if anyone's ever had a question how to do something, I want to, I want to, know, I want to be able to show you that th there's probably a way to, to work around what, um, what you're trying to do and make it work with you because this this project has probably made made me learn quite a bit with, uh, of this uh, plugin. For example, another thing that I was using uh, buffer layers for uh, is if we look back at the video, uh, at the very, come on, switch back. If we look back at the video at the very beginning, you can see that the, the background appears first. We'll talk about that weird electric effect later. Um, you see that the, the background appears first and then the stomping paws fade in later. How did I do that? Well, in case you uh, haven't seen the video yet, I probably put it in the description that the video for this, the pause, the background, all of those effects, I made myself in Blender. So the floor, the background, and then the pause were all made in Blender. Uh, and what I did was I exported the picture uh, or like the background as a picture and you see if we go back over here the background image right here is just opaz bg for background that is that is just the background image you see i can get rid of the background the background actually consists of um the background and the floor but uh so because blender is a a 3d a 3d software it also has physics engines I guess is what I'm trying to say. It has physics engines. So if you look down here, you can kind of see like the, the light bending around the pop pads here is because I actually have some uh, soft body collision phys physics with the floor. So that's why if you see I get rid of the background, the floor is still there because I actually needed to leave the floor uh, visible, I think at least, uh, so that I can have the pop pads collide with them and squish uh, realistically or at least semi-realistically. So if you ever want to do something like that, one of the only times I've, I've had success asking a question on the FL Studio, specifically the, ZG, the ZGE Viz forum, I was trying to figure out how to get the MOV to work. Let me turn that thing off, that's annoying. The, I was trying to figure out how to get the MOV to work, because if you don't know, the MOV video format allows for transparency. So uh, if, you'll see, if, you, if we press play here, And if that doesn't lag like that, you, you can see that uh, there's actually the, the fog machine happening behind the pause. Uh, there's the stars and whatever the other effect is that we'll talk later happening behind the pause. So the pause themselves, the, the pause themselves are on a transparent video layer. Uh, and I got that from uh, actually in Blender. And I think there's in a few other places too. So if we're trying to make an effect in, I think, uh, uh, Adobe Premiere or some other video program uh, you can export uh, if you want to get the transparency layer or if you want to get the alpha channel rather 
uh, you're going to want to export the video into a MOV format. But more so than that, I found it best if you're given the opportunity to export in Blender at least you can change the video codec. Uh, if, you, if you set the video codec to uh, PNG, uh, as opposed to, I believe I watched a tutorial that told me to use the, the QuickTime video container with a uh, QT, uh, QT RLE, QT animation, something like that, uh, codec. Uh, and that worked, except it was very unstable. Uh, in I guess in other programs specifically FL Studio and Z Game Editor and it was kind of frustrating so I I thought that it was a problem on uh, on Z on ZG Evis so I went to the the forum and asked for help about that and me and it was uh, Vil K or Val K one of the staff members of the forum uh, I guess uh, was actually working with me through trying to figure out how uh, how we can get this transparency, this transparent video to work uh, properly in FL Studio uh, and I guess with uh, Z Game Editor. And uh, it essentially turned out to be that um, the PNG video codec works better. I don't know why, but uh, I've tried it a few times with not only this, but like a few other animations that I've made in Blender, including actually, I can probably show you this here, uh, including this little paw transition that I made for uh, my gaming channel. If I click this, I hope that's been captured. I actually, I actually made that. That's using that's using the same paw that's in this music video. That let me get rid of that because it's gonna do it again. That's actually using the same paw that I have here. This paw, oh, this paw right here. It's actually using uh, this paw uh, that I made in Blender, and then I I exported that with a FFmpeg file format with the QuickTime video uh, encoder and the PNG co uh, codec. All of these technical terms, I don't even know. I found that that works best for transparent videos. Uh, I've probably talked about this for too long now. If you have any more questions, like I said, leave them in the comments and I'll probably better articulate them in text than I am verbally. But moving on, one last thing I wanted to talk about uh, buffers is for uh, compositing. Another definition that I'm going to look up just so I can get a better explanation for what is compositing because I know that compositing is also a like uh, a, a filmmaking term uh, and compositing is essentially uh, combining visual elements from separate sources into a single image. That's the definition from Wikipedia and the basic form of compositing if we look at this uh, if we look at the video here if I get rid of the pause here you see that you have all of that stuff going on in the background. Uh, you got the, for one, you got the background. Like I said, you got the background layer, which is the background and the floor, which the floor disappears whenever I get the, um, the pause up because it has its own floor. You can actually see that here. If I get rid of the pause again, yeah, you see the, the stars and the fog are appearing in front of the floor. And then when I bring the pause back, they're no longer appearing in front of the floor. So now they're just part of the background. But so, uh, the the buffer layers. Uh, allow for that level of compositing. Uh, you can actually see that the fog also says fog out because whenever I have an out somewhere, so you get background out, uh, text out, that's because those are th that is the buffer layer from whatever that effect is. So the fog effect, again, I have the buffer layer for the fog, the fog machine effect uh, because, I mean, I don't know, for, for some reason, this whole project, I was having issues with the, the fog and I don't know why. So I kind of have like this, the fog machine and a little bit of color correction uh, going on on the fog machine. I have it incredibly bright. And then when I over here on the uh, fog out layer is where I change the uh, alpha, even though you can see that that's all the way up and it's still not very bright. So I don't actually know what is going on with that. That might be because of the color correction, which I have over here, but even that, I'm not too sure, or the color grading, I guess, the color correction. Uh, I don't entirely know why the fog isn't coming out that much, but with all the effects that I ended up having in this video, that's probably for the best that that's as faded as possible. But so yeah, that's another reason why you would use the the buffer layers is so you can get the the compositing that you want. I used to have the, the, the color shaper uh, over here on the video layer, which I'll talk about later. Uh, I used to have the color shaper on the video layer, which is where the paws are. Uh, well, which is where the, the original animation was. This was before I was able to split the background and the pause into two separate elements. But after I after I was able to switch that, you see now, whoops, you see now I actually have it, um, it's past the background, this electric effect, 
uh, the dark spark, which is another effect that I'll talk about, the stars, the fog, uh, the bloom, which is another compositing thing, and then the background, which is uh, background out. I didn't rename it. That's just the one with the pause on it. So you have background image and background out. The background image is the background. The background out is the one with the pause on it. So I have this in front of all of that. The bloom layer, I have before, uh, I actually have two bloom layers. Let me get rid of some of these layers real quick. So I have the bloom snare. There's bloom all, which this one's set to one of the crashes. Uh, and again, uh, if you don't know how I have those specific uh, effects working with specific elements of the song, you see I have bloom to snare, bloom to crash. If I open those, that is an effect called parameter shake. I have the bloom, uh, which is layer Z. If you don't know, uh, you can hover over the enable disable button or or nope, just the enable disable button of the effect. And if we switch over to FL Studio or back to the screen, uh, you can see in the top left, it says uh, enable disable layer Z. So if you ever are, are renaming your effects and you lose which layer number or letter uh, the layer is, you can hover over that and it'll tell you which letter. And then you go over here uh, into your layer and you can pick from uh, A to Z. And then in case you need more layers, which for me, I actually use quite a few layers. I think up to, I think up to 50 or 51 layers I used. Uh, you can select which layer you want. And then the parameter, same thing uh, as the uh, enable disable. If you hover over any of the parameters in the top left of FL Studio, you see a parentheses, uh, you see a number in parentheses. That's the uh, parameter number. Uh, that you're you're looking at. So when you go back over here to um, Z Game Editor Visualizer, you see it says parameter and it gives you a number. That's how you find the number. And this is pretty much saying layer Z, which is this one. Uh, I want parameter eight, which is the bloom level, obviously. I don't know why I had to second guess that. The bloom level uh, to react to up here, you see audio source. Uh, that's where, if you look in your your mixer, your um, your mixer or whatever it's called, uh, it's using all of the names for your. Oops, it's using all of the names for your mixer tracks, and what you can do from there is you can apparently change the thing. Uh, you can select which audio source, which mixer source specifically, uh, you want that parameter to react to. So you see, for bloom to snare, obviously I have a set to snare two. Bloom to crash four. I have it set to crash four, and that's apparently layer 49. So that was an afterthought. You can see the thought process of when I added these effects. Also, that's spelled incorrectly, but it's fine. Uh, so yeah, uh, I think it's gonna uh, wrap it up with the buffer layers because there's uh, a few other effects that I wanted to talk about in case anyone had any like questions about uh, how to do specific effects. The next effect I'm gonna talk about is the audio spectrum that I have over here at the bottom. I actually just recently switched over from using the polar effect. I don't even know if you saw that. Yeah. I don't know, I'm not used to this this setup where it's it's changing to two different monitors, so I, I gotta remember to click over to wh whichever monitor I'm talking about. But I actually just recently switched over. If we go to right here, linear audio spectrum, uh, I used to use the polar effect. And if I switch to that, not there, it is in peak effects. If I switch to polar, you can see that it gets this, um, this, I guess, half circle. I think one of the, the parameters are being altered. If you switch, if you have a parameter set and you saw, uh, here, it's just, it's just by numbers. Uh, if you change an effect, it'll, it'll keep that parameter number, uh, affected. So like if you have it automated or if you have it set to uh, a parameter shake layer. If you have that parameter being affected by either of those changes, it'll still carry over even if you change to a different uh, effect. So I guess be careful with that. So I used to use the polar one, uh, and I might go back to that. I don't know. I'm testing out. The, this is the first video with this new layout, so I'm I'm testing it out to see how it works. But for this specific video and for this specific I guess layout that I decided to change to, I actually switched over to I switched over to the linear effect, which of course I have it set to. Uh, the master audio source, which just means it's going to receive a uh, signal from everything. Uh, and you can also change the image layer if you want, which is actually pretty interesting. Uh, because if you have it set to, let's say, 
I have, I'll explain what this image is and why this is here in a moment. Um, if you have a, an image layer or an image source set to this layer, as the, as the music plays, it'll like appear. Uh, let's see, is it enable bitmap? So you can see that you can get the, the image to appear if you enable bitmap. And then as the music plays, the, the image will appear. So that's an interesting thing. I, I don't use that, or at least I haven't used it yet, but that might be an interesting thing that you might want to use. Uh, the other thing I want to talk about next is the, li the lyrics and text and how I got that to work. Because in case you don't know or you haven't seen uh, any of my videos, uh, you can actually use uh, FL Studio or and you can use Z Game Editor Visualizer to get your text uh, on screen and have like on screen uh, lyrics. The thing is, that requires patience, patience and time. So if we go back, you probably might have seen it for a moment. If we go to uh, add content and then text, actually, let me get rid of this so we can see more. Uh, we go to text. Here, you can see the text type here is displayed in text effects such as text draw. You get your title and author macros, and then you have pretty much all of the individually spaced words for the, the, the lyrics of the song. First and foremost, I want to say that I used uh, ChatGBT's help here. Uh, if I pull up uh, my notebook here, uh, you see, I actually, I have my text or my lyrics here. That's not what ChatGPT helped with. It helped a little bit. I think, again, if you read the description of the actual video, the lyrics came slightly from the help of ChatGPT because I'm not the best at writing lyrics. If I were to assume how much of the final result ChatGPT Chat gave me uh, compared to the lyrics I wrote, I'd say it's like 5% ChatGPT, 95% uh, me. Because honestly, I don't know if the AI is any better at generating lyrics than I am. I, I did get some lines from it, like, um, I think the rhythm is so sweet and something about all of this stuff. I'm drawn to your energy, your vibe. I just thought that was a weird line. Uh, but then when I couldn't think of any other line, I was like, oh, I'll, I'll add that line here too. But anyways, how did chat, uh, how did chat GPT help here? Well, since I already had the lyrics written down, the way that FL Studio does lyrics, at least on Z Game Editor Visualizer, uh, is it uses the, let me pull up the effect real quick. It uses the text line parameter. There it is, lyrics. Uh, it uses the text line parameter. And essentially what, what that does is whatever text you have on the line, it'll show that entire line of text. So this, song was actually probably one of the most ambitious ones that I tried doing because I've wanted to do something like this before where each word pops up at a time so that's that's an easy effect to do the problem is it just takes time uh, and mainly it takes time for two reasons the, the thing that ChatGPT helped with is I, I copy and pasted my lyrics to it and told it, uh, hey, I need you to individually space all of these words so that there's one word per line so that I can use it. I think I even said so that I can use it in FL Studio for my video or whatever. Uh, and it, it did it pretty effectively. You see, uh, the entire uh, song is individually spaced, or at least it was. Uh, like this part right here, I think was individually spaced, but I wanted that to be one line, so I changed that. Um, and then things like this. Uh, and then also here, just recently, I changed this so that it can be... I forgot to zoom in so you guys can actually see it better. Uh, I changed this so I can have that be on one line. And uh, if you don't want to use ChatGPT, you can do it by hand. Just know that you have these tools to uh, at your disposal and mostly free, I'm pretty sure something like that any model can use. I was using ChatGPT4 because I wanted to see what it could do, so I actually got one of the subscriptions. In case you don't know, those things usually are subscription-based, so use at your own discretion or whatever. I actually rather enjoyed the help that uh, that lended me because it made quick work of, like I said, what would have taken quite a while to write down or to space out each of these words and something to know if you do try to do something like this is breaks like this in the lines also count as a line so if you have an extra space there that counts as a line and if you want to uh, erase something that takes away a line now why is this important 
well, when you're messing with the, the text line uh, slider, it is very important uh, to know like, or that it knows the increments of which it's working with because you have your, your start and then you have your end. And then just if you have like three lines, you have uh, an item here, an item in the middle, and then an item at the end. Simple enough. But if you have like this many items, the slightest change can ruin the entire like positioning of where the slider is. And speaking of which, in case you wanted to know how to actually uh, get the animation or like the text to animate like that, well, that's the second part of where I where I say that it takes time. Is if you go down here, this is where I have my video effects. Let me move that out of the way real quick. Also, this can go away now. Um, that's the second part of where I say that it takes time. Because you see right here, I have the layer uh, text anim, text animation. That's the wrong one. You see right here, I have lyrics effect. Uh, and that's where I have all of the animations here. You can see it looks like a it looks like a more or less smooth line up, but that's because uh, that's just the flow that the lyrics takes. If we zoom in here, we can see that there's actually little steps, and I've just animated each position manually. And essentially, what you would do there, if you hold Control, if you don't know, you can hold Control uh, and then move a parameter, and it can make like small adjustments. Here, let me actually bring up the things so you can see it moving. Uh, if you slide it like this, you can see you can get it. Uh, this is without holding Control; it goes pretty fast. Uh, but if you hold Control and then you slide it, you can actually get it to be the the smallest of adjustments or the micro adjustments. And then what you do from there is you get it to whenever it's the next word. Uh, right click, copy value, and then paste it into the automation clip. And you just pretty much do that for every word. So even though I got away with not having to type down every word in the in the text page, I still had to animate every word for the text line. And you could probably use uh, a, uh, a slope, but that probably won't be as, as trustworthy because you want it to make sure that the text stays on screen for long enough. So you probably don't want to use a, a slope. You want want to make sure to have, you see these are all um, the, the hold mode. Uh, so these are all uh, held long enough such that they can be visible for the entire duration of the word. And then down here, you just see like the scale. That's how I get the, um, that's how I get the, uh, that's how I get the, the text to again, uh, animate to, to fade in, to fade in and then also enlarge just to, just to make it, you know, pop more. Uh, I have the automating the alpha and the scale. And then again, specifically you see uh, over here, it says lyrics out and then this one says lyrics text line. So if we go over here, the lyrics layer is automating the text line. And then if we go over here, I'm actually automating the scale and the alpha of the buffer layer uh, in order to get the effects to, um, I guess, automate more effectively. When you're messing with, uh, with text layers, things like font size, uh, position X and Y can change because of the alignment horizon. If you change the alignment horizon and then try to animate it within uh, within the layer, uh, it'll change the position of where the center is. So you see, I have align horizon center. If I have the align uh, align horizon to like left or right, and then if I try to change the um, the font size here, actually I'll show you. If I try to change, if I change this to let's say left, and then change the font size, you see that it's scaling not from the center it's scaling from like right here it looks like uh, and then same thing for if i set that to right it's it's scaling from right there uh and you see that's that's not really ideal if you want to have a uh or if you do want it to to align to the left or right and you don't want it to scale specifically from one spot if you change the um the the buffer layer scale scare the buffer layer scale you see that it's more, uh, it's based on its anchor, which its anchor is center. And you can change this one to anywhere you want it to be, and it'll be, you know, it'll anchor to wherever you want that anchor to be. But yeah, so that's, that, that's how I, I get my, my text effects. And then you see that there's also, um, you see that there's also the um, text anim effect, which this is just the, the, the fade in of, like I was saying, the, uh, the, Automation of the 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 y axis on the um or I guess the y position, so that the text enters and exits the um, the mask. You see a uh, mask mask translate. 
that's how I get the reveal. Well, actually, that's not even how I get the reveal. That's just because you see that I also have this, the, what is, what is being animated? Oh, that's not supposed to be there. That's the wrong mask. That's supposed to be for the audio spectrum. All right. Uh, well, that doesn't matter anyways. Um, you see the, 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 the position for the text comes in and brings it down into the mask. And then you get the masked, uh, the mask position uh, going from left to right and that's how you get it to fade away and then let's see you got a similar effect over here in the second bridge uh, where I have the little Easter eggs to my previous songs uh, show me your paws and then werewolf and it's pretty much the same thing uh, I think I use the same layer no I use a different layer I, I would have used the same layer but I figured might as well put in the extra effort so if we go back over here you see I actually have their own layer with another mask uh, coming in from here. I got the, the mask color and then the mask translate. I think this one's a different setup because again, like I said, it took me a long time to figure out how to get the masks uh, to work that I think I even changed how it works here. So um, you get the, uh, and I think this one specifically, uh, unlike the text layer, I don't have the text entering the mask. Uh, I have the entire mask changing so it can reveal uh, the word or like the line. And how that effect is done is essentially just the mask. Like, can I show? Yeah, I can. I can show you the mask. So essentially, how that is done is again, if you remember, in order for it to be revealed, I could have done it um, inverted. So if we go back over here, you see that uh, you have the the white center and then the black outline. I could have had it inverted and just like revealed more white and then just uh less black um but uh if i wanted to reveal it has to be within the white and then anything that i want to hide is going to be in the black so uh if if uh if you look again it's just the the white square moving from left to right it starts over here because also this text uh is is appearing because of the Uh, I don't entirely know why I have that like that, but it's fine. But yeah, so that, that's how that's how this effect is. It's just it's got the the mask itself uh, moving from side from one side to the other for all of these. This one, this one, and then this one as well. Uh, it just takes uh, timing. You can see again, this is another one where, uh, oops, the position is. Um, uh, you can see that the position is changed um, manually and meticulously. So that it can appear uh, per w per word. Yeah. Anyway, so the next the next effect that I want to talk about are the the pause themselves. Uh, so you may be wondering earlier in the video I said that I I animated the pause myself in Blender. If you look in a spot like uh, like in the chorus. And it's simple enough. They're going to the quarter notes. But then if you look at the, if you listen to the, the kick, the paws are actually animated to match with the kick, uh, the kick pattern, at least for this part. When it gets to the second verse, I didn't bother to try to do that, but it's, uh, it, it's, it's animated to go to the kick pattern. And you're probably wondering, well, did you do that in Blender? Uh, I probably could have, but I didn't want to. So I actually have, uh, the, the entire clip is actually just a four bar here. If we take um, this pause nompies here, um, if we take the, the base one here, uh, this is a one, two, three, four, five, six, a six bar animation from start to finish. It's just six bars. And I have this as the base because I was using this as reference to make the animation. And essentially uh, what I have going here, going on here is if we go back to uh, Zegam Editor Visualizer, uh, if you want uh, an animation, say like a video or a GIF file also, if you want that to animate um, to the music, you're gonna wanna know uh, how many frames per second the animation is, and then how many frames in total are in the animation. 
Uh, and then once you have that information, you can work based off that how long you want your video to be or like the the animation. And if you go to um, add content images, you're going to want to have sync video with song position. And if it's a bit as if it's a bigger file, which for MOV files are usually pretty big, you're going to want to enable video preloading so that it can uh, store the video onto uh, your RAM and load it faster. This is preloading. So that whenever you're previewing it, it can, you know, spend less time trying to figure out how to load it and just load it, you know, quickly. Uh, and then what you're going to want to do is, so if we go over here to background HUD image and then video controller layer. I have, again, I, I like to use HUD image for my images because it, it's just more uh, flexible. You see the scale is only in the center. And if I change that, then it changes like much larger or, or just smaller, just disappears. As opposed to the regular image layer. Uh, the, if you go to image, image effects, the regular image layer is, uh, it starts off big. So I can't get any bigger than this. Uh, and then you can get smaller, you can't get any smaller than this. So I've, I've uh, for a while now, have been using the HUD image layer because I prefer that one for more flexibility in altering the image. Uh, but so uh, you see that the animation is not moving right now because we have it sync, uh, on sync video with song, uh, with song position. So if I were to press play, and um, this isn't here. Um, you'll you'll see you'll see. Well, actually, you won't see anything because this is this is off. If we push if we push play here, and then we check the video again, you see that it's it's animating. Uh, and then at some point, we're gonna see that it stops because. And then it restarts again because it keeps going. So a, a few things about why I have this um, this effect here, the, the video controller layer effect. The six bar animation that I created uh, in Blender is just two, uh, two bars of um, the, or I guess four bars of the, the pause stomping to the beat, or at least as close as I could get to the beat, uh, the tempo, uh, and then two bars of just standing still so I can have like the fur effect moving and add some add some more movement. Th that's why you see most of these, it starts off with the the animation um, end so I can get like the movement, which again, doesn't matter as much because that was before I changed the, uh, the way that the animation works. But I have a go through the entire animation here and then it changes back to the bottom here. Uh, I actually have it so that in the animation, if we look, It's it's it, again. I, I kind of wanted the pause. This was this was an afterthought after I made the animation. I wanted the the pause to go to uh, to sync to the kick the kick patterns more or less. Since it's just quarter notes, I figured it'd be simple enough. Uh, in order to do that, I, I made sure that the pause were the right tempo, which I more or less got them like to the frame the tempo that I wanted it to be. Uh, but it still was a little um, not as accurate as I wanted it. So uh, to fix that. If you have uh, the video controller layer, what what this uh, automation clip is automating uh, is the position, the position slider in the video controller layer. So you see if we bring this back in, bring in the alpha, if I move this around, you can see that it moves the animation uh, how I want it to be. And uh, this is why I'm saying if you wanted to animate a video or a GIF to the um, to your song, you're going to want to know how many frames are in your your animation. Uh, and how long is the animation, or how the, the the frame rate of your animation, and how long the animation is, because uh, you can take your position slider here, and if you go from start to to finish, uh, it'll make sure that your animation plays only for the duration of, you know, from start to finish. So if you have uh, four bars um, from start to finish, uh, like this, just pretend it's from start to finish, it'll play. Uh, that animation from start to finish, uh, which would mean that it, it go it's going to the tempo of your uh, of your song, but only if the frame rate matches the uh, tempo of your song. Uh, so since since for my animation, I made sure that the frame rate of the animation itself matched the um, the and, and each frame of the animation matched the tempo of the song. Uh, 
I am essentially only uh, animating the positioning of it, but also I wanted to make sure that uh, it was in sync, and for some reason, um, it wasn't that in sync. So if you look closely, it's actually offset just slightly. I don't know why it wasn't entirely in sync, so uh, that's just something to, to, I guess, be weary of if you are going to use the video controller, is sometimes the animation won't be entirely in sync, so you might want to change It's only like a few, like, whatever increments this is. Oh, here, I, can, I can't even move it. I have to hold, if you hold Alt, you can, again, use um, uh, micro adjustments. Uh, the, the best way, I guess, to explain how holding Alt works in the in the playlist is it it uh, ignores whatever uh, snap to grid you have. So if, if I have snap to grid and you see you can put no snap, uh, if you don't want to change that and you just want to change one element of on your playlist, you can hold alt and it'll change uh, to, to no snap to grid. But there is still like a uh, an increment that it'll base off of, which I think if you want to change that increment, you can go to uh, options, uh, project general settings and then the time base here I believe is what you would change if you want the increments of that to, to be more or less but yeah one last note on how the animation works uh, in Z game editor visualizer is you're gonna want uh, if you're noticing that it's not working even though you, you've had everything um, the, the way that I've suggested you set it up make sure that whatever um, video or gif uh, image source you're using the video controller has that same source because that way the video controller is is telling whatever uh, image layer is using that exact same source to animate to it. So you see this one's set to the, the, the animation test, new test, and there's a lot of tests that I just had to go through. So it's just a weird name. This one has the same image source. So this one's, uh, this video controller is telling this layer uh, that it's controlling its image source. And that's essentially how it works. I guess very roughly and stupidly explained, that's how that's working. Now that we've talked about some of the more technical things about um, this this whole video project, I wanted to talk about some of the smaller things. Because with this video project, uh, I kind of wanted to have some more like flashy effects going on. Because I, I felt like with the, the pause being there, it would probably just be a bit weird just seeing the pause stomping by themselves. I kind of wanted some more effects to to detract from um, from the possibly odd nature of the pause. Uh, so I was looking around some other effects that I wanted. I watched a video by I believe his name was James Lee on YouTube. One of the one of the the interesting like I'll, I'll call him a visual effects artist because what what he does. I watched uh, I think one of his music videos. I don't know if it was his song and also his video. But I watched um, one of his music videos and what really stood out to me about uh, what was interesting is his his whole like animation video effects style comes from him and his uh, his gestures, his movements. Like he'll do like uh, an expression uh, that looks unnatural and that's because it's an expression that he's performing and then take it into VFX, uh, a VFX program and like alternate it to make it even more over dramatized. That's cool, but by itself, it could probably look weird. It's, of course, paired to music, uh, and that's what uh, what carries some of it is the fact that he has the video, the effect going to the music, um, the reaction going to the music. Um, but what I feel ties it all in is uh, behind him and, uh, of course, in sync with the music, there were just like some extra, I call it eye candy. I don't know if that's the, the term that other people have used, but I call it eye candy. If you know about music production, there's ear candy. It's little things in like the the background of a song that uh, sometimes are audible, sometimes aren't, but it's there to just add a little bit of flair to it so that it can like fill in a, a space or something. I wanted more eye candy so I can fill in some of like the, the blank spaces of the of the song of the, of the video and uh i was looking around i of course i have the uh the stars going on over here i have the stars like i said there's the fog effect that for some reason is very faint in the background uh one of the uh i guess eye candy effects or technically two are the the bloom that i have which if you don't know what bloom is it's pretty much just like um, the amount of, of extra light that, uh, I guess is allowed in. So you see, oh God, if I change the amount of bloom, 
you see the bloom is like the amount of of light that's being i guess processed i don't know i don't want to really look at how uh the definition for bloom that's that's one of the, the, the eye candy is the amount of bloom that is being changed uh whether it be to to one of the crashes or one of the, the snares uh that just adds a little bit of flair every now and then so that it can you know uh i guess keep visual interest another effect that's a, a, a bit of eye candy i don't have i don't have it too high because i don't like that that dramatic of an effect but if i bring this up a bit uh you might be able to see uh the whole video is like shaking back and forth that is the handheld uh the, the yulian handheld effect you see uh if, if you want to see what it looks like i can turn it up and then you can see more of the effect it looks like someone's holding a camera and like shaking it back and forth that's why it's called handheld um i like to have like a, a subtle again it's supposed to be eye candy it's supposed to be like a little bit of flair to add visual interest but i don't want it to be i don't want it to detract from the entirety of the video so it's just a very like i don't even know what um that's a six percent which i guess that's six percent and then i actually have uh the zoom also uh because something that um the shake you see that uh that's where i have it and if i pull the zoom out it's a very small amount but if i don't have that that zoom in there let's say if i turn this back up again you can see like up here it's actually like showing you the border of the video uh, or like of the image and personally i don't like having that because it i don't know looks weird so if you if you zoom in a little bit it'll you can still have the dramatic effect but since there's now extra video uh outside of the border whenever it shakes over there it'll uh disguise that by showing you you know where actually more video is so so that's how i uh, I like to have my handheld effect is I like to have it a little bit zoomed in and a little bit uh, a very small amount of shake there's also oh no that's not the right one the other effect that's a bit of eye candy is the shake effects I actually have four different well I guess four shake effects the, the main shake effects are the audio shake I have the audio shake to kick one and kick two in two different locations so Something I've started doing recently, and something that most, uh, I guess, most EDM music producers, or maybe most music producers, I don't know, uh, will do is they'll have two different kicks. One main kick for like the, the main portion of the song, so like uh, the the verse, uh, the hook, you know, the build up to the drop, which is the chorus. Um, they'll have like a softer kick, uh, so that it can like be behind the vocals, and then for a more intense uh, drop, you can have a a, a more intense kick uh, for the chorus. And to emphasize that, I have um, the audio shake one on the kick. That's only if you see, that's only affecting all of the background elements. So uh, you see, this is where the background is, and this is the color grading of the background, and this is the handheld effect, which these can be uh, changed back and forth. Uh, and then the audio shake is only affecting the background elements. So whenever we get the words going, So if you notice, the background and the pause are the only things that are getting a very subtle amount of, of audio shake to the kick. Uh, and again, like I said, I like to have the like the subtle effects. So this is again like a very, this one's 3%, even less than the handheld effect. Um, and I like to have that very subtle uh, amount. Uh, and even more so for this kick, I just want it to be like a very subtle pulse that is still moving something, uh, but not again detracting from the entirety of the video. Whereas this one, uh, whoops, uh, this one is a supposed to be a more dramatic effect, but I might have turned it down again. So if we go to the chorus, so you can see, so you can see that this effect is is affecting um, not just the background, but now also the text, the spectrum, and the pop pad that's down here. So this one's you know taking everything and and shaking everything to the second kick just to add you know more emphasis on the drop aspect of the song in addition to the audio shake which there's also uh if you go to post process there's the audio shake effect and then there's uh down here uh yulian auto shake I, I believe some people prefer to use this one because it's, it has more uh more options here so you can change it to like specific frequency change the attack and all this stuff you can also change the zoom rotate uh move and opacity is what is being affected by uh 
by the audio source. Uh, I just like the simple audio shake. In addition to this audio shake effect, if we go back to the parameter shake, uh, so let's see, the paw pad is the one. Uh, the paw pad actually have uh, it. Um, you see that I have the layer H parameter seven. That would be this layer, the the paw pad out, and then parameter seven, of course, is the scale. The paw pad out layer is coming actually from again one of the stacks of of effects here. Pretty much the thing that's going on over here is this is actually like I said, this was uh, an object that I made in Blender, and I exported the object file. If you go to add content meshes, you can actually import 3D objects. I think, uh, I don't remember if they, if they, okay, so these are all of the supported files, or they, the supported 3D model formats, the 3DS, uh, OBJ, and I guess their own ZGE mesh uh, file format. So that's interesting. But you see, I exported it as an OBJ or an object file. And then using the HUD mesh, I have the imported. You can change uh, like the, the the material of the um, of the object. You can see I have it flat right now. You can have, whoops, you can have it um, smooth. You can have just the wireframe, which apparently isn't working, and then flat wireframe, which that might be working. I think this object actually has a lot of polygons because I'm not the best at at specifically retopologizing. So. It's a good thing I don't need to process any physics on this. And then you got uh, point and x-ray, you know, just, just some other stuff. In, in case you haven't messed around with the the um, HUD category of Z Game Editor Visualizer, I do recommend using it because it, it's, it's, there's also, you see the HUD 3D, which I think is actually a different thing. I think it makes an image 3D. So that one could be interesting as well. So yeah, so there's, there's, there's some interesting things that you can mess around with that. But I, I have that set to um, 3D mesh and then that's where my paw is. Uh, and then from there, I have the paw. This shadow over here is actually the um, the 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 drop shadow that I was mentioning earlier. So you see, I have the uh, drop shadow effect going on, and then both of that going out into this this paw out, so that whenever I move this, it doesn't just move. Or I guess whenever I move uh, this, it doesn't just move the paw. It also moves the shadow. Uh, and then of course, um, the parameter shake is affecting the scale uh, and that is uh, important to note that uh, for, for 3D meshes I definitely recommend using buffer layers because I was having a lot of problems especially here at the end with this image here uh, so I actually I actually with this image here sorry I keep forgetting to click over when I'm talking about things uh, for this image here uh, this is another paw layer I believe no this is the this is the same paw layer it's just um, I, 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 I changed the positioning of it and if you if you look uh, if you look here I'm trying to figure out why there's two separate ones uh, in case you don't know about this little feature if you for some reason are dumb like me and you forgot what you what you've automated if you double click on the automation clip it pulls up this and you can click on this uh this thing right here uh and you see in the top left it says automate target link parameter and if you click on that it'll show you uh what it's supposed to show you uh i don't even know what it just did uh it'll show you um oh it, it didn't open it but it's it's this right here So yeah, I do have another one, but what's happening here, I see it now, is I'm using the same uh, paw pad mesh um, layer uh, here. Well, I guess technically the, I'm using the same stack buffer out layer. So the paw pad shadow for both paw pad out and any paw pad. So you see paw pad shadow and then this one's using the same thing, paw pad shadow. Uh, and the reason why it's I'm doing it like that instead of uh, say changing the position of um, of this the way that three that 3d meshes work it's a 3d mesh is different than an image since it's a 3d object it actually has like depth to it so if you move it up and down you're gonna see like the top of it or the bottom of it depending on where you move it to uh so i at first had it that i was gonna move this one if you were to change the the x and y positions of the the pop pad mesh uh, or the the h the 
HUD mesh, uh, it'll change the perspective. Oops. And then also that it's um, whenever you're dealing with buffers, you got to remember that you're you're exporting or you're um, routing the output of this image to another image file. So you see how this is has its own borders. If I were to move this and where it's clipping right there is where it reaches its border. So that's another reason. Or that's another thing to think of when you're doing when you're messing with um, buffers is y you can move things around within the the stack. Just be weary of uh, be wary of the uh, the borders of that stack. Um, but if you're moving uh, the mesh within its layer, you're actually changing the perspective. So you see, I'm seeing more of the bottom now, and then if if it wasn't so low, I'd be seeing more of the top. So I actually um, just to make it easier on me, I grabbed the same output from the mesh uh, or from the the the, the mesh stack, I guess, and just put it on two separate layers. That way I can just have it like already in position whenever uh, whenever it fades in. And then pretty much the fade in and fade out are actually an interesting, uh, not really interesting, just like a simple effect. So you see right here it says fade out alpha, and then when, when it fades out, um, they're still... Uh, like, it, it's, it's fade, it's, this one fade out is... And making everything disappear, I guess technically except for the paw and the, and the spectrum, is making the the paws and the background fade out, and then this outro screen fades in. This uh, fade out effect is actually just a a like black image, um, which if we look is the fade out solid color, and you see it's just solid color, and all it is is just it it changes the the alpha um, so that it, it can fade out. And then that way, again, with the compositing, you have the fade out, and then you have the ending paw and the um, outro screen, which is the uh, this thing. If I get rid of the if I if I get rid of the paw here, you see that the outro screen is just all of this. Uh, previously, I had it had all of these things on separate layers. I just took it into Photoshop and uh, created one outro layer. And you got yeah my little jokes here that you may or may not see at the end of my videos uh, because I'm making sure that I put videos there. But you, this is all on one layer, and then you got the paw on another layer, and then you have both of those over the fade out, so I can fade out everything except for this as they fade in. Uh, as you see over here, the um, the spectrum fades out, the paw fades out, and then uh, this, which is the the paw. And then the outro screen all fade in and then they fade out at the same time that the song fades out. So these are all effects that you've probably uh, seen before because those are, I guess, the main effects that people use. The handheld, the uh, parameter shake, the audio shake. Those are the ones that you've probably seen in most people's uh, audio visualizer, Z game editor visualizer, uh, videos and tutorials and all that stuff. Um, but I do have uh, two other effects that I just... Uh, recently discovered while I was trying to find, like I said, some more eye candy. Uh, if we look uh, at the chorus here, and if I bring the video back over here, if we look at the chorus here, I'll turn this effect back on and then we'll see. So there's actually two things happening uh, as, as the chorus comes in. Uh, one of them is happening throughout the entire song. Uh, it's it it may be subtle. I try to make it subtle, and I, but I also wanted to bring it up so that it, it can be noticeable, because again, I I wanted to add an effect to, you know, spice up the video, but I didn't want it to take away from the rest of the video. So this uh, d dark spark effect, if I bring this back over here, uh, and if I bring the well, so so th this is an interesting thing about this effect. Why is that okay? This is an inter th interesting thing about this effect that I didn't realize. So this dark spark effect, uh, for one, uh, is under the canvas effects. Uh, it says dark spark, but it's also a, um, reactive to the music. So you see, I have it set to the, the crash. One of the crashes. I think I have like five crash uh, crash samples, um, and the image source. Uh, I'll get to that in a second. Uh, well, actually, no, the image source for this one specifically is the 
uh, the, the paw logo. So if we look at, um, cause I can't change the alpha and just have it be, have it be noticeable. It has to react to the song. So those paw pads that you see in the background are actually this, this dark, this dark spark effect, uh, which I think is an interesting little effect, especially that you can change it with the, uh, the image source. Um, it can actually be much brighter too. If I set that up. So see, they're they're much brighter for an, uh, an effect that's called dark spark, uh, and then I can I've tried turning it down before also. But see, if I put it too low, then it's a, a little too faded behind all of the other effects. Uh, so I just I have it right here, which I think is fine. You can change the color. Whoops, change the color, size, the position. I don't think I changed much of that. I did change the spread because I wanted it to spread out more. Uh, and then you change the sensitivity, which is is how much it is. You know sensitive to the music, uh, a higher sensitivity or actually a lower sensitivity will make it react uh, more and the higher sensitivity will um, actually react less. So see it didn't even pop up. Uh, it's pretty much like how the, the, the threshold works in the audio spectrum uh, effects and like the polar effects. If you have the threshold set uh, higher, then uh, the spectrum reacts less to the, uh, the audio source. So that, that's that's that effect. Just like a, another simple effect that I, that just adds a little bit to the um, to the the video. Uh, next to this is the electric effect, which I had to turn off because every so often it'll just like break, I guess, and it'll just be happening. I'm not sure why, but uh, th this is something that uh, is the result of that previous thought when I mentioned James Lee earlier that I wanted some more like eye candy, uh, like f flickering in the background. He had like some specific like swiping effects um, in the in the background of his videos that uh, I, I I liked and I wanted to try to replicate, but I couldn't find anything uh, in Z Game Editor Visualizer that uh, I thought would be as interesting. Except for this, you see that this has its own movement to it, uh, and what this is, this one um, doesn't have uh, any audio source or image source. Um, however, it does have the speed here. And what I did was I tried my best to match the speed slider to the tempo, which I think even still, if you look at the video, isn't as lined up, uh, like it, like it could be. But, um, what I, what I have going on here, if you look at it, And then if you look at the, the alpha slider, it's being reacted to something. Because if we look uh, over here, I actually have the bloom is reacting to the snare. If you don't know, you actually have two sets of um, links that you can make in a, in the parameter shake. So if you want two objects or two layers to react to one audio source or like the same audio source, you can, you can do that in, you can do that with the parameter shake. So I have the layer Z, which is the bloom. And then I have layer 50, which is the electric shake. Um, being reacted, and then one, of course, being the, the the alpha parameter. So I have both of that being reacted to the, the the snare, and essentially, I just wanted like a, a little bit of the effect in the background. So you see, if I actually let me turn that off real quick. So you see, if I have that, uh, the way I've composited it again is right in front of the background. So you see, that's just only reacting to the background right there. Uh, and that was just again just uh, another simple thing that I that I added to add some more effect, um, some more like visual aspect to the video. Uh, I specifically wanted it to happen um, more frequently. So that's why I put it to the uh, to the the snare uh, as opposed to manually changing it because I, I didn't want it to happen too often, but I wanted it to happen more often than uh, most things. I was going to do it to the vocals, but uh, I decided to go with the snare because the snare does play uh, mostly throughout but not entirely. A couple more things that I wanted to mention uh, before I wrap up this video. Some more like smaller things uh, is the the stars effect in the background. You see that actually. Just let me go here. There you go. Perfect. Well. There we go. Perfect. So you, so you, you saw there maybe that the, the image of the stars actually changed in case you don't know, 
uh, with the it's all it's full of stars. The, it's full of stars effect. You don't just have to have this basic star effect went on. Uh, if you go over here to so your image source, you can change the image source of whatever you want your stars to look like. But not only that, if we look over here, uh, I actually have um, some automation on what's called the uh, custom image index, which is the image source over here. You can actually right click this and then create automation clip of which image thing. And I've noticed that uh, unlike the text, the text line slider, it's not based on how many objects are there in total. It, it seems to have like a predetermined amount of objects, which is weird. So if, if you're trying to uh, adjust your this thing manually, you can see like the spacing between these lines are is very minuscule. Uh, so what you're gonna want to do is you're gonna want to like when you change the image. So whatever this image is, I'll, I'll right click it and then copy value or press C. Uh, and then whenever I go over here, I'm gonna want to right click it and then uh, press V to paste value, and then do that again. Change the uh, the image layer. Right click, copy, and then paste over there into your automation clip. That way you can actually get some automation on the image source. So if we look, uh, actually if I bring this over here again, so you see I actually have um, this one being automated here. And then one more time back to the stars. And then I just have the alpha being, being, being automated. And what this holding one is, if you don't know, is you can have the, the holding parameter if you change the holding parameter of the stars, what it does is it does this weird thing where it like groups them all together. And then when you release it, it causes the explosion to like, you know, pop, I guess. Uh, so that's, that's a, a little bit more in depth on the, on the, on the, it's full of stars effect in case you've ever wanted to know more of what it can do. Another thing I wanted to mention, uh, as the lyrics are happening, uh, or as like as the vocals are singing, uh, you'll notice something about the video, uh, or you you may or may not have noticed about the video. Uh, I actually have it so that whenever the vocals are happening, if we go back over here, you may have seen it earlier when we were looking at this. Um, you have uh, blur to vocals. And um, I essentially, because I had the, the lyrics on screen, uh, or rather the lyrics in the video, I wanted the, the whenever the lyrics uh, popped up, I wanted those to be the uh, center of attention as opposed to the pause. But I didn't want the pause to be like too obscured in the background. So I, I actually have uh, a blur layer over here. Over here, it's on the, um, the pause specifically. I was thinking about rearranging it and, uh, so that it covers everything like I did with the, the color grading, but I guess I'll leave that here. Um, also, why is that on that? That's weird. So you see, I have the, the blur here and uh, pretty much what it what it does is it blurs. Let me turn that off real quick. It uh, it blurs the background uh, slightly as the vocals are happening. And if I turn on 10 amount, you can just get some real intense blur for some reason. Something I noticed with the transparent video is whenever it blurs, there's this weird black outline around the object. I'm not sure why that happens. That's just something that I guess happens and to be aware of. But yeah, so I have it. I have it set to blur to the vocals so that whenever the the vocals are are singing, the pause themselves are blurred. But in addition to that, you might notice this one says layer W parameter two, and what that is is actually over here in the audio shake layer. I actually wanted it to darken also so that again I really wanted the words to pop and when the the, the image is just uh, blurred. You, well, not that much, but it, it, I, I, it's a subtle blur amount that happens when the, the vocals uh, occur. And it, it was almost um, not noticeable. So it, to emphasize, or again, to emphasize, to better emphasize that the background is being, I guess, pushed in the background behind the vocals, the audio shake layer has this alpha slider. And I don't know why, but the, if you change this alpha slider, you see it actually, well, let me turn this off again. Uh, you see actually the background gets darker. Yeah, so this um, second set of uh, uh, parameter shake things over here uh, automates this alpha slider. Again, ever so slightly. You see this says uh, 
shake level uh shake level and it looks like it's gonna be a lot it kind of is but with the parameter shake it's probably a bit late in the video to be saying this but, but with the parameter shake you set the base level and then the 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 shake level the parameter can shake anywhere from here to here but based on the input coming from whatever audio source you have it set to the louder the signal from the audio source the more intense this reaction would be uh, compared to the level so if i had it like at the maximum loudness that the i guess the vocals in this case could be transmitting it would reach all the way over here and it would look something like this uh but you see it doesn't it doesn't ever do that because the vocals aren't as loud i mean if we look at um what they look like like this is the vocals right here um the vocals aren't as loud or at least aren't transmitting as much of a signal uh, as opposed to if we go like over here, um, right here where it might be the loudest. Uh, well, right now you see that it's not doing anything. It doesn't have any effect because it's not going. But if I play it while that's happening. Uh, actually, let me bring that back over there so it's easier. So I see it, it doesn't get pretty dark. That is until the, the bloom comes in and lights it back up. Again, it's, it's just like another one of those little... Uh, effects that I wanted to do to 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 add some more flair to the video. I don't even know if, if anyone will have noticed that had I not explained that in this video. But yeah, it's just uh, if you wanted to to add some more effects to your video, that's an, that's an option that you can do. Is you can change the lighting, change the, the the colors. One last thing that I want to talk about is the color grading here. Like I mentioned it before, the dub switcher color shaper is uh, pretty good at making it um, like emphasizing your overall like I guess video if I turn that off it might not be, uh, like make much of a difference you see it actually uh, looks kind of darker now uh, I actually added a little a little bit of um, fade a little bit of I don't know what I added but I, I, I changed it a little bit so it can look more interesting I used to make it more like dramatic because if, if you change the tension all and the strength all you can get some uh, darkness and light or some uh, some fade and some sharpness I guess and I, I used to make that much more dramatic but uh, for this one I just thought it needed to be something more uh, more simple I guess that's pretty much everything about this video that I wanted to talk about if you had any questions definitely leave them in the comments I know I'm not the best at explaining things at least not verbally if you have any questions about any of these effects or any other things that you uh, have tried to do in, in Z Game Editor Visualizer and either don't know if you can do or you haven't figured out how to do, uh, leave them in the comments and I'll try to res respond to them as best as I can. Like I said, I've been using Z Game Editor Visualizer for a few years now, so I've, I've made it a, a point to try to figure out what I can and can't do uh, within it, uh, no matter how, I guess, stressful it is. Because again, this uh, masking effects took quite a while to figure out and even so as I, as I was showing you, I have the mask here and then the mask translate here. Whereas over here, I have the the mask right here and then the the translate over here. So even within this 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 one project, I had two different methods of how I was doing that. So it, it just took a bit to, to try to figure out. But um, if you have if you have any questions, I'll I'll help you figure it. Uh, I'll help you figure it out because, like I said, uh, this is probably the biggest video that I've I've made so far, and it. it uh, it shows because I think this is one of the ones uh, you'll notice that I haven't tried to have this video playing uh, in full screen yet uh, for some reason well unsurprisingly for some reason uh, trying to play this video in full screen actually kind of lags the video you can see over here in the right uh, I, ha I have the max frame rate set to 60 and then right now it's showing the current frame rate uh, actually I'll show you uh, this time you don't need to see the video, but I'll, I'll show you over here. I ran out playing the video, I'm getting like roughly the max frame rate 60. But then if I uh, put that on full screen, actually, let me play first and then full screen. <laughs> you can see almost instantly the frame rate drops because that's a lot of effects that it's trying to process. So. I think that's I think that's the first time that that's happened where a video that I made is uh, is is in FL Studio kind of lagging the, the whole the whole uh, program or lagging the whole plugin I guess uh, so yeah if if you have any questions leave them in the comments I'll um, 
I'm trying my best to to respond, give you some feedback, any tips or tricks that I've learned uh, using Z Game Editor that I uh, definitely wouldn't mind sharing. I don't know if if I will do another video like this, um, but if I do. Make sure to subscribe so you'll see it uh, or also make sure to subscribe for my music. This was just kind of like a thing because like I said there's a lot of effects going on here and I kind of wanted to explain how some of them worked in case uh, anyone else who's been using Z Game Editor Visualizer wasn't aware of the things that it could do. Um, that I, I just wanted to show show off some of the stuff that it could do since this is probably the most things that I've made uh, ZGE Viz do. So. Uh, so yeah, so that's probably going to be it for this video. Thank you all so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a like. If you liked it enough that you'd like to see more uh, of v videos like this or of, of course, my music, uh, consider subscribing. Until then, this has been Day Music. See you next time.